tonight to have America's pastor with us, a man that is not only a, an apostolic leader, but also someone who carries a mantle of pastor, prophet, really off the five-fold ministry, operates through him. And you never know what you're going to get with John Kilpatrick. It's according to what spirit comes upon him. I know it's I know which spirit it is, but I mean I'm talking about which anointing gets activated in him. You could get Pastor John, and I love Pastor John, but you could also get Evangelist John, and you might get that. You might get Apostle John, Prophet John, or you might get Teacher John. And I like all five of those guys. Now I'm making him sound like uh, he's schizophrenic. I don't mean to sound that way. I'm just telling you he's multi-talented. This man carries some rich oil in his life, and we're so thrilled to have him. How many of you got to visit Brownsville at one time or another, or you've been affected by the Brownsville revival? Wow, many of you in this room tonight. Well, that is where I first learned about Pastor John Kilpatrick, but since that time, I mean, he leads so many other ministries, the Church of His Presence down in Daphne, Alabama. Anybody got to go down there and be with them in church? Wow. And the things that God is doing, he and I got to share quite a bit today. Some of the things that God has him doing right now, it's so exciting to be a part of that. He goes around the nations, impacting the world, spreading the fire and the glory. And I tell you, every time I hear him speak, something gets birthed in me all over again. I know you love having him come here. So I want you to get on your feet right now. And let's give a proper welcome to this great man of God as he comes to bring the word. Well, thank you very much. I know I've got five personalities. I may have six. I'm not sure. <laughs> Don't you love Brother Brian and Sister Faith? Aren't they doing a good job? You know, every time I've been here, I've always loved and appreciated him because he's got, he's a leader and he's an educator, but you can tell at heart he's a pastor. And he's got a pretty red-headed wife too, I'll tell you that. It's so good to see all of you here tonight. One, one more time, if you don't mind, how many of you have uh, you've been, you, you came to Brownsville or you've been affected by Brownsville? Could I see your hand? Just stand up just for a minute. Let me look at you. Oh, that's awesome. My goodness, look at this. Wow. That's awesome. Hey, girl, good to see you. God bless you. Well, Brother Perry Stone, where'd he, where'd he go? Is he still here? There he is over there. Brother Perry, there's only one Perry Stone. There'll never be but one Perry Stone. And we love you, we love Sister Pam. I tell you, you know, when something happens in the world prophetically, I'm always trying to tune in Perry Stone to see what he's saying. That man knows more about Bible prophecy. I'm telling you, I've been listening to him since I was a little bitty boy. <laughs> Before I get started tonight, um, I'm going to be speaking on a subject that I want everybody to pay really close attention to. I'm going to get done with it as soon as I can, but I'm not going to be in a hurry. You know, the way I look at it is in these days and time, why be in a hurry? Let's take our time and let's hear from heaven. Yeah. Amen. But I got a message here concerning Jezebel, and it's called Power Brokers, and it's called Unmasking the deception of the Jezebel spirit. And I'm not going to take time to talk about these, but every one of them I would say is worth listening to. And if you could listen to them, I know it would help you. And I just got through preaching this at my home church. It's called Mark, Marked. And um, in the tribulation period, the Antichrist will mark his people. In the tribulation period, God will seal his people. And then I talk about Mark and the intercessors, and then I talk about many other things. It has to do with Mark. The way this came about, the Holy Spirit spoke to me one morning, and um, I was walking across the floor, and the Holy Spirit said, have you ever wondered how the spirit world sees you? And I'd never even thought about it, how the spirit world sees me. And he said, those that are sealed with my spirit are marked, Job was marked, 
When you dedicate your children to God, they're marked. The children of Israel, their houses was marked. You know, I could just go right on down the line, but it has to do with God's seal of ownership of your life. And what the Lord was saying to me was, Satan sees you and knows that you're marked and he can't do whatever he wants to do to you because you're marked. And so I'm gonna leave that there. I just, um, 2019, I was in the bed at home asleep. I got up and had just gone to the restroom and I came back and it was about three o'clock in the morning. The room was dark. I was laying on my right side facing the wall and uh, I just turned over in the bed. Just absolutely turned over in the bed, just that simple. Well, when I turned over in the bed, I had an experience that I can't really describe to you. I wish I could. I know it sounds a little bit mystical, but it's true. I had an experience where I turned over in the bed, and I, when I turned over in the bed, I turned over into another world. That's the only way I can describe it. I didn't hear the Lord's voice, but I heard the Lord. He talked to me, but I didn't hear his voice in my ear. I don't want to use the word telepathic because I don't believe in that, but it was, I guess it was something along those lines. He was talking to me. I couldn't talk back. I didn't want to talk back. I wanted to hear everything he said. And here's what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said, I want you to tell the people. This was, this was December the 19th, 2019. This is... Um, months before COVID. Nobody knew anything about COVID at that time. I certainly didn't. And the Lord said, I want you to tell the people perilous times are coming, not just perilous times, but extremely perilous times. And the Lord said to me, tell the people to not be afraid because I'm sending my angels to help them in these perilous times. And uh, he said, I'm going to give my angels special charge over them. A drape of death is going to fall over the nation. A drape of death. And he said, a drape, a drape of death is going to fall over the nation. But he said, I'm giving my angels charge over my people. And they are going to help them. And he said, matter of fact, help is on the way. Tell them not to be afraid, not to be disoriented. The angels are going to come help them. They may never see the angels, but the angels are coming to help them and all that they have on every side. So I immediately pre preached this series on the angels are coming. And these things really have been successful. They sold really, really well. And that was in December the 19th. And since that time, we all saw COVID break forth and et cetera, et cetera, which leads me to my message tonight. I'm going to be preaching tonight on Spellbound. And you see the Statue of Liberty there with a mask on. I'm going to be talking about some things that I want you to hear. These things are not um, something that's a rehash. What I'm going to be talking to you about tonight is important. It seems like every time, Perry, that I come to Omega Center, it seems like something important is going on in the world. You remember one time I was up there preaching and you stopped me, and that's when Obama and the Supreme Court had just justified, you know, same-sex marriage. And then I was here at 911, uh, the celebration of that, and, and so many different things. But then today we see on 222-22, that's apostolic, today is an apostolic day. Isaiah 22-22 is an apostolic number. Today is 2-22-22, and here we are at a time that Putin is about to invade Ukraine. And I believe that God is going to help the Ukraine, and I believe it's going to turn out better than anybody can imagine. They've been praying a long time. They've been praying for years for God's help and God's protection, and it just could be that Mr. Putin oversteps his bounds and draws back a nub. Amen. And then I have two books with me. I have a book that I wrote some years ago when I was in revival at Brownsville. It's called When the Heavens Are Brass. We sold a lot of those books. I think you'll really enjoy that. And then another book that me and Dr. Brown wrote together. 
And uh, the forward is by Jack Hayford, and it's called The Fire That Never Sleeps, and it's talking about revival. So I believe that you'll enjoy those. If you'd like to go by the resource table after the service, I believe you'll enjoy that. I want to take my time tonight, and I want to talk to you about some things that I know has got to be on your mind. And because it's on your mind, uh, you know, when people come to the house of God today, they want to hear things that's on their mind talked about. And you know, what's going on in the world in a religious, spiritual way is not going to be talked about on CNN. It's not going to be talked about on Fox News. It's going to have to be talked about in the house of God. And I think it's time that some of this frivolous stuff that we're talking about in the house of God ceases, and we need to start talking about the things that's on people's minds. So tonight, I'm going to be dealing with the subject of spellbound, and I'm going to also talk about place, position, and authority. I was awakened recently by the Lord, right before 2020, and the Lord told me that perilous times, extremely perilous times was coming, but the angels was going to come and help us. After COVID broke loose, the Lord showed me that a veil of death, a drape of death was coming over the nation, and there was going to be a lot of loss of life. After that happened, I heard the Lord speak to me one morning, and it said that this virus did not just have a medical aspect to it, but it had a spiritual aspect to it. Now, I don't know how a virus, I know how a virus can affect people medically like a pandemic, I understand that very well. But how it was formulated and how it was released, maybe by the Chinese, only God knows who all was involved in this, but as it was released, it covered the earth. It touched the nations of the earth. And it not, it not only has medical aspects to this virus, but it has a spiritual impact. It has some kind of a devilish, unholy anointing associated with it. And I'm gonna talk about that for a little bit tonight. I wanna to talk about you. I wanna talk about who you are. I wanna talk about what you possess. I wanna talk about what Satan's after. And I wanna talk about people that you know that Satan is after them. And I want everybody to leave here tonight not depressed and not afraid, but I want everybody to leave here tonight conscientious of the fact that the devil is after your place, your position, and your authority. And I'm gonna talk about that for about the next 45 minutes to an hour. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken and only the things that cannot be shaken will remain. So everything that can be shaken, the Bible has already said that it can be shaken. Everything that cannot be shaken will not be shaken and it will remain. So it's up to us to find out what cannot be shaken and to latch on to it and to anchor ourselves to what cannot be shaken because many things that we thought could not be shaken has shaken right before our very eyes. And you know it and I know it. And it's been really disconcerting for a lot of people to see things and situations crumble and shake and crumble and collapse to the ground that you thought you'd never see. So we're gonna take a look at the things that cannot be shaken. Some of the things that are being shaken so, so severely will not recover. They'll never recover and they'll never be restored as we knew them before. It's gone. And the Holy Spirit is in it. The Holy Spirit is still in the process of shaking. I wanna let everybody know that I'm, say, I'm speaking this prophetically. This is not just a sermon, but I'm speaking this prophetically to you that many things that are being shaken has not been shaken yet, but will about, are about to be shaken. And some of it has to do with politicians. Some of it has to do with ungodly laws that's trying to be established. Some of it has to do with ungodly churches that have left the faith and they're now preaching doctrines of devils. It's coming down 
And I tell you right now, it's coming down and it's coming down fast and the Lord will not permit it any longer. Many things that you will see bite the dust will never be resurrected again. Why? Because God is about to pour out revival in the nations of the earth. Somebody give him praise. I said, God is about to pour out revival among the nations of the earth. Can you shout amen? Yes, Lord, let it be. So, Satan has made a discovery. Somehow he's seen it. Satan is not omniscient, he's not omnipresent, he's not omnipotent. Satan does not know everything. God knows everything, he's omniscient. Satan is not omnipotent, that means all powerful. Satan has a limited power. Satan is not omnipresent. He depends on a world of demons to keep him informed and other ranking demonic spirits, including powers, principalities, and rulers of darkness to keep him informed. But God is omniscient, omnipresent, and, omni and omnipotent. God is all of those things. So the devil right now is seeing in the spirit world that God is up to something. I believe that it's possible. I can't say this for sure, but I suspect it. I believe that it's possible that there's a great awakening about to break forth among the nations of the earth. This virus has not only affected America. This virus did not just affect Great Britain. This virus did not just affect a, a nation here and there. It's affected the nations of the earth. And a great awakening will affect the nations of the earth. And so I'm believing that Satan sees that something's going on. He's, he's gonna fight it. He's gonna try his best to resist it. But when God rises up and God gets ready to move, you're fighting a useless battle and you will not win it. God is gonna have the last say. And I believe there's gonna be a great last day revival before Jesus comes. And I believe it's gonna be a powerful great awakening. Now with that said, I wanna talk about a few things before I get into the meat of my message. You talk to people today and they know that something is strange. It's not just a medical virus, it's not just a fever. It's not just congestion in the chest. It's not just a regimen that you take to get rid of congestion and to try to save your life. Something else is going on in tandem with the virus. And you talk to people today, Christian people, as well as people on the street, and here's some of the things you'll hear. I've, things feel so strange to me, they'll say. I can't think straight. I'm having trouble thinking straight. I can't keep my thoughts straight. I feel confused. Others will say, I don't feel hopeful like I used to feel hopeful about America. I don't feel hopeful like I used to feel about my family and about the economy and even about the things of God and the work of God. Things have changed. People will say, it seems like almost everything has changed overnight. I feel that my friends and my family have changed. I feel that my Christian friends have changed before my very eyes and they don't seem like the same people. They seem colder. They seem more calloused. And they'll say, it seems that something has settled in over our nation and it seems that it flows from Washington DC outward to all 50 states. And whatever's going on in Washington is now affecting governors and the states of our nation, and our nation doesn't feel the same. But one thing I have learned is that crisis is the hinge on the door that leads to breakthrough. Crisis is the hinge on the door that leads to breakthrough. If you stir the attention of God, be assured you're gonna arouse the attention of Satan. So I wanna jump right in and I wanna start talking to you about place and position and authority. First of all, we come to an understanding that we are given three things when we're born here. We're given a place. 
Everybody has a place. Everybody has an atmosphere. You may live in a condo. You may live in a house trailer. You may live in a travel trailer. You may live in an apartment. You may live in a mansion. You may live in an apartment. But everybody has a place. Everybody has an atmosphere. It's an appointed place. God appointed you to be where you are right now. And believers literally occupy a place in the spirit. And the Bible says that God knows before we're even born the place that we're to occupy on the earth. The Bible says he has made us from one blood, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. And he has determined our pre-appointed times and the boundaries of our dwellings. Look at that. He has predetermined and pre-appointed the boundaries of our dwellings. I live in Alabama. I was born in Georgia. During the whole revival at Brownsville, I only lived in Pensacola for a brief period during the Brownsville revival. I had to move because I lost my privacy. And I moved across the river, the Styx River into Alabama. Steve Hill lived in Alabama. God somehow determined that we both live in Alabama during the Brownsville revival that touched the world. God has determined where you live. God has determined where you're born. God has determined everything about you, your goings and your comings, where you were to be born, where you're to live, and where you're to be in the last days. And God knows the place where we're supposed to live. And he also knows the places that we're supposed to be. I know beyond any doubt in my life, in, in, in my mind, that my life, is in the Lord, I'm hid with God in Christ, and I know beyond any doubt that I'm supposed to be alive today. I know that I'm supposed to be here tonight. I know that I'm supposed to live in Alabama. I know that I'm supposed to have a church in Alabama. And I know that the same way I know that about myself, if I had an opportunity to hear you and to know you and to listen to your story, I would say you're right where you need to be. The second thing is that God has determined is our position. Everybody holds a position. You may be a husband, you may be a wife, you may be someone's son, you may be someone's daughter, you may be an intercessor. You may have the position of a minister, one of the fivefold. You may hold the office of a political figure such as a mayor or a governor or a city councilman or a county commissioner. You may hold the position of being a supervisor in a business, in an industry. You may be the manager of a grocery store. But I don't care who you are. Everybody has a place. Everybody has a position. Everybody has a position. And along with that position comes an authority to hold that position. A place and a position has been delegated to us and the authority has been delegated to us to operate and to maintain our place and to hold that position. Authority is given by God. The church has a place, the church has a position and the church has authority in this hour. We're not here by accident. And is the authority that Satan wants. When Adam was in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve was in the Garden of Eden. When Satan came in the garden as that slithering serpent, he did not look like a snake. He could talk and he could walk. But he was extremely beautiful. He was extremely intelligent. And he was extremely mesmerizing. So whenever he came in the garden, he didn't go to the zebra. He didn't go to the hippopotamus. He didn't go to the dog or he didn't go to other animals. He went directly to Adam and Eve. Why? Because what Satan is after, he was after man's authority. God had delegated that authority to man and Satan went directly to the authority in that garden. What was he going to do? He's going to try to deceptively deceive Adam out of his authority. His schemes... 
His plans and his attack is to get us to yield our God-given place, our God-given position, and our God-given authority over to him through whatever method he chooses to use and any of the methods he chooses are powerful. Satan mainly goes by three titles. He goes by tempter, accuser, and deceiver. He goes by those three titles, that's his MO. He tempts and temptation is a very powerful thing. Temptation has brought a many a man and woman down. It's caused a many a man and many a woman to lose their anointing and to lose their ministry. It's caused many places that you see and you, you look at it, it's caused many people to lose their place in the body of Christ. Prophets, apostolic people, they've lost their place because Satan is such a tempter. And then the next thing that he'll use is accuser. And he accuses, beats you down, humiliates you. He accuses God to us. He accuses us to God. And he accuses us to each other. And he accuses us to ourselves. So when you're dealing with the accuser of the brethren, you're dealing with his accusations on four levels. He's accusing God to us, hath God said. He's making God look like he's unfair. He's making God look unjust. He's making God look like that God's against us. He's accusing God to us. He's accusing us to God. That's what he did about Job. You mean to tell me you really have confidence in Job? You gotta be kidding me. And then he accuses us to other people. And then the bad thing about it is he accuses us to ourselves. I saw something one time and I never forgot it. It said that people, when they're talking, they can speak up to like 1,500 words a minute. If you talk real fast, you know, you, you're telling a story, whatever, you can speak up to 12 to 1,500 words a minute if you're talking. But when you shut your mouth and you're not talking, you're still talking to yourself, but because you're not articulating your words, you're thinking up to 3,500 to 5,000 words a minute. And one of the reasons why psychologists try to get people talking and they put them on a couch and try to get them talking is because it's slowing the mind down enough that they can begin to articulate really what's on their mind and their mind's not flying out of control. Are you listening to me? And so when the devil starts his accusations and when the devil starts accusing and he starts accusing you to yourself or he starts accusing other people to you or accusing God to you and you shut your mouth and you start thinking about it, it can drive you crazy because it's just it's just so many words, so many words, so many words. It's just in your mind, you can't shut your mind down. You can't go to sleep. So Satan's schemes and his plans and his attack is to get us to yield our authority to him through whatever method he uses on us, either by temptation to tempt us or to accuse us or to deceive us. And deception is a very powerful thing. Deception is not play acting. When a person is deceived, they're really seriously deceived. They're, they're not acting. So, if the devil's successful in stealing our authority, it's gonna open your children up. I've noticed many times that when a man is tempted of the devil with pornography, or to be unfaithful to his wife and he has children. I've noticed in many cases, not in every case, but many cases, probably I would say most cases, when a man yields to the temptation of the devil, it opens his kids up to that same temptation. And if a man is sneaking around watching pornography and he's masturbating and watching pornography, that same spirit and that same spirit of the devil comes in and attacks his seed and tempts them to do the same thing that dad's doing that dad yielded to. Because when you yield to that, you turn your authority over 
and you lose authority. You may not lose your soul, but you lose that level of authority. So I want to talk about place for just a minute. I was interested not too long ago when I turned to my Bible and I was reading about Judas. You know, Judas had a place with the 12. Judas used to cast out devils. The Bible said that Jesus sent them out by twos and he sent the disciples out also and the disciples were called later apostles. They had power to cast out devils. They had authority. They saw Jesus. They became journeymen under his ministry. They became apprentices under Jesus' ministry. They saw how he operated. He gave them power and he said, you go and you do what I do. And Judas had power and he had authority. But he yielded to the devil and the devil came and the devil cheated him and he lost his place, he lost his position and he lost his authority. And it's interesting in Acts chapter one, it says, Peter's quoting this and he said it's written in the book of Psalms, Peter said, let this dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office. In other words, he was a bishop. He was, he was a, uh, Judas had a place on the apostolate. And the Bible says that he forfeited that and let his dwelling on this place of the apostolate, let it be barren, be desolate. Let, let no one take that place that Judas had, but we're going to keep the office open and that office will be filled by somebody. Acts chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spoke before the, concerning Jesus, uh, Judas, which was guided to them that took Jesus, for he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. It said he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry, but now he lost his place. I want to say this to everybody watching by live streaming. And I want to say this to everybody under the sound of my voice. I want you, if you don't hear another thing I say, I want you to hear what I'm saying to you. Satan is after your place. Satan is after your position. And Satan is certainly after your authority. And if he can get your authority, you'll be like Samson. You'll shake yourself as at other times but you won't realize that the anointing has departed from you and you'll be as other men. That's what he's after in this hour. Why are preachers under attack the way they are? I watched Brother Perry and I prayed for Brother Perry and Sister Pam. We need Brother Perry's voice today like we've never needed his voice. Can somebody shout amen? And I know Perry to be a man of God, but I also know the times that we're living in, Satan is vicious and he'll stop at nothing. But I wanna to say to you, Perry, tonight in front of everybody here, don't you ever let the devil have your position. Don't you ever let the devil have your position. Don't you let the devil take your place and don't you let the devil steal your authority because your voice is needed to speak in this hour. God bless you, we're praying for you. That's right, come on everybody. So Peter, Peter was explaining what happened to Judas. Judas permanently lost his place in the spirit because he turned Jesus over to the hands of wicked men that came after him with torches. He betrayed innocent blood. Judas permanently destroyed his place on that apostolate. And whenever Adam was in the garden, as long as Adam was in the garden and Eve, and they had not defiled themselves with that tree, that one tree, all the other trees you can have, just that one tree. As long as Adam had his authority, nobody was sick. Nobody sick, nobody died. As long as Adam had his authority, there was peace. 
He could speak to the bird flying up in the heavens and say, hey, straighten up. And the bird would straighten up. He could say to the mammals in the sea, hey, straighten up. He had authority. One thing I'm trying to tell you is this. In this hour, the thing the devil hates more than anything is people of God that has authority to call his works to naught. But I'm telling you, he's got a surprise coming. There is a level of authority that's coming in the fivefold gifting that God is about to turn loose that's gonna give the devil heartburn. Are you listening to what I'm saying? As long as Adam held his place, there was no sickness. As long as Adam held his place, there was no thorns. There was no famine. There was no poverty. There was no caskets. There was none of that stuff. As long as Adam had his place of authority. What's the devil after? He's after the authority. He's after your authority. He's after my authority. I'm going to be honest with you. I ask you to pray for me too. Because I know the devil would like to take me out. And the devil would like to take every other man and woman of God out. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Are you listening to what I'm saying? The devil would like to take your husband out from the table in your kitchen. The devil would like to take the mother out of your bed in the family room, in the bedroom. The devil would like to take your kids out of their bedroom and take them to the streets. But we're rising up tonight and saying, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Are you gonna take my child? You're not gonna take their place. You're not gonna take their position. Shapa Hayana Mayando. It's strange, I was reading here a while back about Timothy and I saw something I'd never seen before. The Apostle Paul writing in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, he said, Timothy, I put you in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And that word fear there comes from the word dilea, and it means cowardness. Let me read it in the NIV the way the Apostle Paul said it and let me substitute that word. The Spirit of God does not give us a spirit of timidity, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And what Paul was saying is, Timothy, one thing I'm observing about you is you've lost the fight of God in your life. You've lost the fight of God. It's lying dormant in you because you're intimidated. And when I looked up the name Timothy, it comes from the word timid. The prefix in Timothy is T-I-M, and it comes from the root name timid. And what the apostle Paul was saying to Timothy was, Timothy, don't let the fight of God lie dormant in you because you're intimidated by Satan. And I wanna say this to you, if the devil can, he's gonna come and he's gonna try his best to intimidate you. But I have made up my mind. I am not gonna let the devil intimidate me. No, not now and no, not ever. Why? Because the work of God is just too far, far too important. And you can't afford to be a powerful man or a woman of God and walk around intimidated. Intimidation from the Oxford English Dictionary says to render timid, to inspire with fear, to overawe, to cower down, to suppress, and to restrain from action due to cowardice. Well, let me show you something interesting as I begin to look through the scriptures with all this going over in my mind and I was building this message about the power of place and the power of position and the power of our authority, I began to look through the scriptures and man, I, I was really surprised at what I saw. Which leads me to remind you once again that whatever God is up to, and I don't really know all he's up to, but whatever God's up to, it's really big. And it's gonna involve the angels, it's gonna involve heaven, it's gonna involve the fivefold ministry on the earth, 
And I believe that God's getting ready for a major end time harvest. And I believe he's about to send forth harbors, har uh, harvesters into the labor field, yes. into the fields to harvest souls. I believe it's gonna be the biggest thing since man has been on the earth. I believe the devil knows that's about to come. I don't know about you, but I'm praying, God send forth labors into your harvest field. But with that happening, I begin to just notice and I begin to go back and study about people in the Bible. And let me just show you something that I found that was a little bit, it just sort of shook me up a little bit. I looked at Moses. Now everybody knows who Moses is. Moses was mighty. Moses was the most brilliant leader the world has ever known. Moses was powerful. He was feared. Moses was an awesome leader and an awesome persona and a stature. He carried a stature about him that no other person on the face of the earth carried. Right before Moses was to go in before Pharaoh, right before, usually the devil will hit you right before something really big is about to happen in your life. Could I say that again? The devil will usually hit you right before something big and something successful is about to happen in your life. And the Bible says Moses was about to go into Pharaoh and command him release the Jews from Egyptian bondage. And Satan tried to put a spell on him. Now I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to say something. You might not expect John Kilpatrick to talk about a spell, but I want to go, go ahead and tell you now, I'm convinced of it. And I'm not going to back up from it. So don't write me and don't call me and try to change my mind because my mind's made up, I'm right, and by crack is you're wrong. <laughs> but I want to talk about a spell. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Right before Moses was to go in before Pharaoh, it says Moses said to God in chapter three of Exodus, who am I, who am I, that I should go in unto Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now let's just stop there just a minute and just see how ridiculous that sounds. Moses is the guy that has great power and great authority and his stature and his stamina is so awesome that God looked to Moses and God could communicate with Moses face to face, eyeball to eyeball. God and Moses were equals in many ways. God loved him and God could communicate with him. And Moses, when God said, I want you to go before Pharaoh, Moses, that, that, that spirit that was on Pharaoh and that spirit that was controlling all those two and a half million slaves, that spirit rose up and put a spell on Moses. And it caused Moses to forget who he was. It was a spell. And he said, who am I that I should go in and deliver the children of Israel from Pharaoh's bondage? Who am I? And isn't that just like it is so many times when God's about to do something powerful and God's looking around on the face of the earth to find somebody that he can use that would rise up with great confidence and rise up with a powerful anointing and rise up with great authority and all of a sudden we come under the spell of the devil and we begin to talk like we're atheists. We begin to talk all kind of crazy stuff. And the Bible says, who am I that I should go in and bring forth the children of Israel? He, was, he felt worthless. Moses felt worthless. The great man Moses. He felt incapable. He was a stutterer. And he was slow of speech. Look at Paul just real quickly. Let's look at this and see. I, I want you just to look at this. Just to look at it, it just shocks me every time I see it. Paul was feeling weak and inarticulate. He was feeling worthless. And Paul said, I come to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. What? Paul, the great apostle, the man that God put on the earth and blinded him, called him to be an apostle, raised him up, used him, and God said, I want that man. He's got steel in his soul. I need that man. 
And then Paul goes out and he starts saying these things. And he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And then in 1 Corinthians 1 and 27, it says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And I know what he's saying here, but he's saying he feels foolish. I know what he's saying. You do too. But he's feeling that foolishness because he's dealing with the Greeks. And he said, God has chosen the weak things of the world. He's calling himself weak. And I know what he's doing. I understand it like you understand it. But he's not showing a demonstration of the mighty power of God. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And Joseph, when God got ready to use him, he had his brothers betray him and sell him to a caravan going to Egypt. And they threw him in prison for doing the right thing. They threw him in prison. But after you come out of prison, if you're not careful, prison can get in you. And after he spent years in prison, that those prison bars had intimidated him and changed Joseph. And it was all to intimidate him because they, Satan didn't want him to be prepared to lead Egypt as a Jew. The attack came, the spell the devil tried to put on him was right before Pharaoh was gonna ask him and give him the keys to the granaries of Egypt. All that happened right before he's intimidated. Gideon, the Lord looked upon him and the Lord said, go your, and this your might and you will save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And he said, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? My family's poor and I'm the least in my father's house. The devil put a spell on him. Here's God speaking to the man. Here's an angel speaking to the man and saying, this is the way we see you. This is our evaluation of who you are. This is heaven's report card on you as a person and as a valiant leader. And he said, oh, but let me tell you who I really am. You, you've made a mistake. You don't know what you're doing. It was a spell Satan was putting on him. Yes, that's right. Amen. He was a nobody in his mind. It was a spell. And then we look over and we see David, how his brothers intimidated him. But I want you to notice a very powerful verse in verse 43. When David got ready to go forth and face Goliath, look what it says. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. When it says he cursed him by his gods, if you go back and read that, interpret it, it says he put a spell on him, tried to put a spell on him. Goliath the giant tried to put a spell on David and curse him. So when David came against him, David was, would fail and he wouldn't have the authority that he needed and he wouldn't have what he needed to be successful. And the Bible says Goliath cursed him and put a spell on him. I read this scripture and I said all that to you to sort of lay the groundwork for this. I read that scripture and I was working on this message and the Bible says that Paul made the statement. He said, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? That word bewitched, listen to me. <laughs> I know this sounds crazy for a preacher to be preaching on spells, but I just want to tell you that's what's going on with this COVID thing. There's a spell associated with COVID. Now, that may be strange for you to hear that, but I don't back up from it. I've done seen too much evidence to know that it's true. Paul said, oh, Galatians, who has bewitched you? And I looked that up. I was leaving out of my house one morning. I went over by my desk and I pulled out some study material real quick and I looked up the word bewitched. And the word bewitched means to put under a spell. Why would Webster's Dictionary say that bewitched means to put under a spell if it wasn't possible for Satan to put under a spell? You say, but oh, I'm washed in the blood. And oh, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, I am too. But I'm telling you that whatever the devil sees coming, 
the devil is doing his best to put the nations of the world under a spell and it's not normal. The things that people are feeling and the, people that th the things that people are going through is not normal. There's something associated with this medical thing that there's a spell associated with it and the devil's trying to bring the nations of the world under oppression. Just like Vladimir Putin tonight is on the outskirts of, of that beautiful city over there and he's trying to bring those people under his control. He's trying to intimidate them. He's trying to put them under a spell. Look who I am. Look at my armies. I've got 170,200 troops out there. I've got tanks. I've got submarines. I've got bombs. I've got airplanes. He's trying to intimidate them. What's he trying to do? He's trying to put a spell on them. You can't come against me. But oh, I tell you, we must rise up and begin to come against what God. Amen. I'm gonna to go to, I'm gonna skip over a bunch of stuff and I wanna take a look at Elijah before I quit. I know this place, this passage rather, has been preached on many times. But before I leave tonight, I'm gonna to deal with it one final time and I want you to pay close attention to it because you may hear something you haven't heard. I'm dealing with Elijah and I'm dealing with Jezebel. It said Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. He'd killed the 400 false prophets of Baal. And Ahab told Jezebel that he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah and she said, okay, so let the gods do to me and more also if I don't make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose ran for his life, came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. There's two things I wanna point out here, first of all, about this first three verses. Let me tell you how you deal with an intimidating spirit. And I'm talking to myself too. Elijah had killed 400 false prophets of Baal. He had dried blood up his nose. He had dried blood in his hair. He had dried blood on his clothes. He had it up under his fingernails. He had killed these false prophets by himself, single-handedly. While he's sitting there, he's tired. He's drained. It was an arduous fight. While he's sitting there, after the greatest victory in his life, here comes this messenger from Jezebel, and the messenger says, I just want to tell you, Jezebel is sending you this message, and she says to tell you tomorrow about this time, your life is going to be the as the life of one of those prophets that you just killed. You're going to be a dead man tomorrow about this time. Let me tell you how to deal with Jezebel. Elijah, instead of letting that get into his spirit and tear him up and dehumanize him and intimidate him, he should have jumped up to that messenger right then and said, what did you say to me? What did you just say to me? Well, Jezebel sent me here to tell you that tomorrow about this time, it's 10 minutes after eight, and tomorrow about this time, you're gonna be a dead man. You know what Elijah should have said right then? Well, let me tell you, let me send a message back to Jezebel. Tell her I'm marking my watch. They didn't have watches back then, but he marked his watch. <laughs> And he could have said, tell Jezebel, I'm marking my watch, it's 10 minutes after eight. Tomorrow night at 10 after eight, if I'm not dead, I'm coming to kill her. Amen. That's the way you deal with intimidation. What I'm trying to say is stop letting the devil beat you up. Start letting the devil bang you around. It's time to stand up to the devil and say, I beg your pardon, you can't do that and you will not do that. It's time to talk back to the devil. And he should have said, just tell her tomorrow, if I'm not dead by 10 minutes after eight, tell her to run and hide because I'm coming after her, I'm gonna kill her. But then the Bible says that when he saw that, didn't say when he heard that, said when he saw that. That's interesting. Because you see, when you hear something, 
it's pretty effective. But when you hear something and see something, it's convincing. And so the Bible said when he saw that, let me tell you what the devil will do. The devil has the propensity that whenever he's working on you, he's tempting you, he's intimidating you, he's trying to steal from you, he's trying to steal your authority, he's trying to do a lot of damage to you, your ministry, your family, whatever, when the devil tells you things that he's gonna do. To hear it is one thing, but whenever you hear it, it goes past your hearing into your mind and you see it. And you don't just see it in black and white, you see it in technicolor. You see it in technicolor, you see it. Oh my God, wait a minute, what did he just say? Tomorrow about this time, and he jumped up, and he ran. He ran for his life. What's she after? What's she after? His place, his position, and his authority. What was he operating in when he killed the 400 false prophets of Baal? He had a place. God had put him there. He had a position. He was the prophet of God the most powerful prophet Israel ever had. The most favored, beloved prophet Israel ever had was Samuel. But the most powerful prophet that Israel ever had was Elijah. And then the Bible says that he jumped and he ran for his life when he saw that. And then I'm picking up with verse four. He went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down on a juniper tree and requested that he might die. And he said, it's enough, Lord, take, me, take away my life. I'm not better than my father's. And so as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, an angel came and touched him and said, uh, hey, Elijah, rise up and eat. I want to show you something about this. If you notice Elijah, whenever he started running, it kept saying that he ran and he was going down. It didn't say he went up. When you start running, it's a downward journey. And he went a day's journey. He had no food. He had no water. And the Bible said he laid down and went to sleep under a juniper tree. And man, God loved him enough to send him an angel. And the angel was a shelf. The Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> and he went to sleep, and he's laying there under a juniper tree. And the Bible says that the angel of the Lord came over there and jostled him awake, shook him, and said, Hey, Elijah. Yeah, oh, yeah, what is it? What is it? And I, Elijah opened up his eyes. Now, listen to me. Elijah opened up his eyes and looked in the face of an angel. And the angel's talking to him, and the angel said, I've come to fix you something to eat. And he said, it's time to rise and eat. You need something to eat, son. You ain't got nothing to drink. You need something to eat. So he jostled him awake and he looked, uh, opened up his eyes and looked and there was an angel. And the Bible says, he says, arise and eat. And he looked and there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. He ate and drank. And I want to tell you what discouragement will do. Let me tell you what let me tell you what despondency will do. The Bible said after he ate and drank the water, he lay down and went back to sleep. Somebody answered this question for me. How can you lay down and go to sleep with an angel still in your midst? You know how? Because you're so depressed, you lose touch with reality. You're so depressed that you lose touch with the reality of who God is, what God's trying to do for you. You can't see that God's trying to help you. You can't see that he sent an angel. You can't see that the angel cooked for you. You can't see that that's miracle water. Yeah. And you ate and you drank and you feel refreshed, but now you're gonna go to sleep and an angel's still there with you in your midst. And what it is, you're in such depression and such despair that you can't even tell that God has sent deliverance for you and you can't even recognize it. Watch this. 
So the Bible says, the angel of the Lord came a second time. Look at that. And touched him again. And the angel said, I'm going to try this one more time. Touched him a second time and said, arise and eat because the journey is going to be too great for you. And the Bible said he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. Well, let's look at this for a minute. minute. Okay. I don't know if you've ever tried to fast 40 days and 40 nights or not, but it's pretty rough. You ever tried to fast just water for 40 days and 40 nights? I made it two days. (laughs) But the Bible says this. It said... He rose and he ate, and that that water was miracle water. That water was a cruise of water, and it was miracle water. It was heavenly water. The coals that was baking cooked some bread that was miracle bread. It was angel food. And he ate it, and he drank, and he went 40 days and 40 nights down, down, and he's trudging through all kinds of terrain, and he wakes up on the third day. He just, he's, keep, he's going down, down, down. And on the third day, he, he, he didn't say, he didn't come to his senses and say, you know what? My God, I hadn't eaten three days. I'm not even hungry. And I hadn't drank anything in three days. I'm not even hungry. I'm not thirsty. Now he's gone 11 days. You know what? I'm still not thirsty and I'm still not hungry. Now he's gone 23 days. I'm not hungry. I'm not thirsty. I feel so good. I feel so strengthened. He goes 35 days. You know what? I still hadn't ate. Oh my God. I hadn't ate. I hadn't drank. I'm not hungry. I'm not thirsty. And then the Bible said he came to Mount Horeb. And here's the interesting thing about discouragement and about depression. When the devil comes to take your place, And when the devil comes to take your position, and when the devil comes to steal your authority, you lose your reasoning faculties. You don't even know what manner of man you are, what what manner of woman you are. You lose that ability to decipher who you are and what God is up to in your life. You can't even see it. And the Bible says, He came to Mount Horeb, Mount of God, and he came to the cave, to a cave, and he lodged there. And the word of the Lord came to him. It said the word of the Lord came to him. And he said, Elijah, what you doing here? How many of you knows it's always a bad sign when God comes to you and says, what are you doing here? (laughs) And look what he says. Now just look at this just for a minute with me. He said, what are you doing here? I want you to look at verse 10. Look at the wording on this. I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, and I, the children of Israel have forsaken his commandments, thrown down his altars, slain the prophets with the sword. I am the only one left, and they seek my life to take it away. And so the Lord said, I'll tell you what do. Go over yonder and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind came and busted the rocks. And then the Bible says that God sent, after the wind, he sent an earthquake and the earthquake shook him up real good, trying to wake him up. Wake up, wake up, come to your senses, wake up. And then the Bible says, there came, after that, there came a fire. There came a fire. When you're afraid, how many of you know when you go to the doctor's office, it's always so cold in the doctor's office? How many of you know you always want an electric blanket in the doctor's office? Because when you're nervous, you're cold. And the reason why God sent him a fire is because Elijah's afraid. He's running for his life. He's afraid of Jezebel. And God sent a fire, and the fire is going to warm him up. Why is God trying to warm him up? To help him come to his senses. So, The Bible says that God sent a fire, God sent an earthquake, 
And God sent a wind so strong that it broke mountains and rocks into pieces. I've been in a lot of hurricanes in my time, but I've never seen a hurricane wind so strong that it busted rocks. This was a concentrated wind. And God's showing him what he can do. He can bust rocks and make gravel out of a mountain. It's pretty good, isn't it? And then God sends an earthquake and shakes him up. Wake up, son, wake up. Come to your senses. Come on, Elijah. You're my man. You're my strongest prophet. Come on, Elijah. Come on, man. Come on, wake up. Come to yourself. Come on, get it. Come out of that funk. Come out of it. He said, an earthquake, wake up. I'm shaking you loose. I want you to think right. Come on. And then God sends a fire, warms him up. And then the Bible says this. Watch this. The Bible says, God said the second time, what are you doing here, Elijah? Same question, and I want you to notice Elijah's response. Now look at this. Let me, before I read it to you, let me explain it to you. Okay? Elijah started running for his life. An angel intercepted him. An angel shook him awake. An angel cooked for him on the coals of fire. An angel got some miracle water. An angel, he went back to sleep. The angel woke him up a second time, cooked some more for him, gave him a cruise of water. He went in the strength of that 40 days and 40 nights. Wouldn't come out of his funk for 40 days and 40 nights. Wouldn't come out of that funk. He wasn't thinking right. He's under a spell. He's under Jezebel's spell. He couldn't, he couldn't think that God sent an angel. Well, if God sent an angel, I'm going to be fine. My God, if, if I got an angel, nothing can defeat me. You see, when you get so heavy in depression, you lose touch with reality of who God is and what God's doing. Y'all listen to me? Now watch this. And the Bible says, he asked him the second time, Elijah, what you doing here? And I'm going to tell you, he repeated verbatim what he repeated when God first in front, confronted him when he got there, he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Children of Israel forsaken your covenant, thrown down the altars, slain the prophets with the sword. I'm the only one left. They seek my life to take it away. So I want to show you God's response. This is where I've been trying to get to all night. I want to show you God's response. God said, I'll tell you what. I want you to go and return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. I want you to go back. And when you get there, I want you to anoint Haziel to be the king over Syria. I've, I've got something left for you to do yet. I want you to anoint a new king over Syria, Haziel. And I want you to anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, to take your place. Because I can't use you anymore. Everybody listen to me closely. When God does everything he can for you, when he sends an angel, when he sends food, when he sends water, and God says, what you doing here? And he sends an earthquake and he sends fire and he sends wind. He's doing everything he can do to get your attention. I'm God. You're mine. I'm watching out for you, bud. I'm taking care of you. I'm standing right behind you, Elijah. Come on. I need you to do your part. I'm going to do my part. Come on, Elijah. Come on now. Come on. What are you doing here? Ask him a second time. He didn't change his diatribe one bit. And so the Lord said this. He said, I'll tell you what. Anoint a new king over Syria. And he said, anoint Jehu the son of Nimshi, to be, uh, he said, anoint uh, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, to take your place. In other words, you're not going to hell. You're my man. I love you. But I can't use you anymore because I can't get you out of this funk. And you're no good to me if you don't come out of this funk. And he said, so I want you to go and I want you to anoint Elisha, the son of Japheth, 
take your place. <clears throat> you know what? God was so with Elijah in such a powerful way that Elijah by himself could have pulled down Jezebel, but he ran. He froze. He froze. He choked. So now God said, I'm going to send a taxi after you. I'm going to send a chariot after you. And you're not going to hell. I'm going to take you to heaven. And so he said, Elisha's going to have to take your place because I can't deal with you anymore because you're not moving in faith. You don't believe me. You're not letting me work in your life. You're not listening to the people that I'm sending to you. You won't even listen to the angel. And I ask you what you're doing here and twice you've been so stuck on your troubles you won't even change your, you won't even change your, your speech. So God said, I'm going to have to replace you. So Elijah could have killed Jezebel by himself. That's what God gave him an anointing to do. But now it took Elisha and Jehu both to kill her. It took two to do the office of one. And you remember, Jehu said when she was all painted up, Jehu said, throw her down. And they threw Jezebel down and she died and the dogs licked her blood up. But here's something interesting that I want you to pay close attention to. When all was said and done, God sent a taxi after Elijah and took him to heaven. But I want to tell you that's not the end of the story. I want to point out something to you, and I want you to pay attention to what I'm going to tell you. I imagine when that chariot came and picked him up, he's going up, 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 up. Now he's a tiny speck, and he remembers I got to drop this mantle off because Elisha's down there, and he dropped the mantle overboard. Elisha went over and picked it up. Where's the Lord God of Elijah? He struck the waters, and the waters parted. And I'm sure Elijah probably thought while the angels was driving that fiery chariot, Man, I don't have to face that no more. I'm through with Jezebel. Wait a minute, Elijah. Because in the book of Revelation, you got to come back and face her all over again. And the Bible says this. It says in the book of Revelation that Elijah's been up there in heaven all these years in his natural body. He's still got his kidneys. He's still got his heart. He's still got his liver. Probably still got most of his teeth. <laughs> and he's been up there in heaven all these thousands of years. And he thought he was through with the Jezebel. But let me tell you something before I let you go here today. Don't be deceived and believe that you can avoid your problems and never have to face them again. You may ask God to come evacuate you, and he will, but he's going to drop you right back down and make you face it all over again. In time, you'll have to go back and face that all over again. You never escape anything. And so the Bible says in the, in the tribulation period, the spirit of Jezebel is in the earth and she's having sex with the prophets of God and you know she's, she's a, a Babylonian spirit, evil spirit, a Jezebel spirit. And God sends Elijah back and he comes down and he's one of the two witnesses in the last days that's going to preach in Jerusalem in the streets of Jerusalem and going to be killed. And after three days, he's going to be resurrected again. But he wasn't through with Jezebel like he thought he was. And God said, you're too valuable to me. I'm going to evacuate you out for right now, but I'm going to bring you back and you're going to have to face this all over again. So here's what I want to leave with you today. As sure as I stand here, Satan is after your place. He's after my place. Satan is after my position. And he's after your position. And he's after your authority. He's after your place as a son to try to take you away from your parents. 
as a daughter to take you away from your parents. He's after your husband to take him away from the family, after your wife to take her away from the family. He's after your preacher. He's after the president. He's after the governors. He's after the prophets. He's after the evangelist. We see it. We're no fools. We see it. We understand it. So three things he's after. Your place, your position, and your authority. So here's what I'm trying to say. God's looking to us. He's looking to us.